Welcome to the Bob Mouse HealthCast, episode number 383. Chemotherapy is not for every patient. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to today's HealthCast. We're going to talk about chemotherapy and its use in breast cancer today. Um, This is a big controversy now. Many doctors are suggesting to patients that they may not need chemotherapy with a particular diagnosis of breast cancer if it is small, if it is early, if it is uh, surgically completely removed. Oftentimes, doctors are stating that a patient may not need that dreaded chemotherapy, which is risky and also has many side effects, kind of makes women have to give up living for a period of time while they're taking the chemo. So today we're going to talk about this controversy, but I want to give um, you all a little lead up in terms of how the cancer diagnosis occurs. Most of the time, a woman comes in for a, um, a yearly visit or she finds a lump and she goes to her gynecologist or a family doctor. The doctor then confirms or denies that there's anything there but in general, we'll then order a mammogram and an ultrasound. The mammogram and ultrasound come back to their primary doctor or their OBGYN. We then look at the results and then decide for the patient or with the patient whether they need a biopsy or not. If it's all negative, they don't need a biopsy. If they do, we do see something that looks suspicious, they need a biopsy. At that point in time, the care for breast cancer then or pre or ruling out breast cancer then gets transferred from the OBGYN and the family practitioner to the breast surgeon. And then the breast surgeon takes over. They do either a needle biopsy or a full biopsy where they take out the whole mass. And then they give the news to the patient. I usually find out later from the patient or from a letter down the line from the breast surgeon what has been uh, found, what is recommended, what the treatment is going to be, and then I just follow along. Even though my patients always, as a gynecologist, always came in and asked me my opinion about what they were doing. So it was a, it, it's a shared responsibility between the primary care or gynecologist and the breast surgeon as to treating breast cancer and the choice of treatments. So, but, but the reason for regular mammograms and regular gynecological visits mm-hmm. is early diagnosis mm-hmm. radically increases your chance of survival mm-hmm. and radically diminishes the need of, of radical intervention. Right, right. So, so we've gotten a lot better yeah. at feeling breast masses and knowing whether they're a problem or not. Fibrous or They're a solid tumor. or they're cystic. And then we all... Cystic meaning they're fluid? They're fluid filled. Okay. So so we've also gotten better, better at feeling it and reading ultrasounds. The ultrasounds have gotten better and they've gotten more specific. We've gone from 2D mammograms to 3D, which is much better at diagnosing cancer. So, so we, all of the technology has improved. I, I believe the skills of the physicians have improved, but I also, I I don't believe the studies that say that self breast exam doesn't find anything because I had lots of people who found their own own Mm -hmm. breast mass and came in and then I'd feel it and I'd be like, well, that wasn't there last year. Right. And then I'd send them for the studies and directly to a uh, breast surgeon while the studies are cooking so and to the breast surgeon. So at the point that you make this referral, you make them to a breast surgeon, not to an oncologist. Well, or is that the same? Breast surgeons usually have oncologists working with them. Okay, but it's out of my hands after that. Basically, I don't get to right. help somebody decide whether they need a radical mastectomy. a radical mastectomy, or they need a lumpectomy, or they need a. Uh, I mean, some women have definite opinions about what they want. Right. 
but well, like Angelina Jolie, mm-hmm. because her she had a family history. But she didn't have cancer of that gene, and nothing had been identified. As I understand it, she had no cancer. nothing had been identified, but she decided to avoid the potential risk as she got older to have two radical mastectomies. Right, and some women aggressively pursue that solution even when they're not immediately at risk. They've not been identified as having. Uh, a cancer. Yeah, and that's that's more because of their family history and what they witnessed with their mother or their grandmother or right, aunts. Right. So, uh, and then to well, get. But, but it's also because for a long time, anytime anybody heard cancer, you have cancer or you might have cancer, they thought, oh my God, I'm going to die. Because right. a lot of people did. But most people don't die who have cancer now. We've been very that's successful. Amazing. Yes, there still are some. There are still some very kinds. aggressive and, types and of some cancer that cause types death. Are, are, are more likely to kill you than others. Right. Uh, brain cancer, uterine cancer, breast cancer, three pancreatic different kinds. Cancer. Pancreatic cancer. Some are still more lethal, but we've made a lot of progress on others. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I remember I had I have a friend who's now seventy eight. 15, 20 years ago, she had breast cancer, Mm -hmm. and we were monitoring her. She was anxious about a five-year window Mm -hmm. because at that point, if you could make it five years after the treatment, they thought, well. Without a recurrence. You you have an indefinite gain, and and she's now 20 years past it. Right. But at that time, we didn't really know anybody that was 20 years past it. Yeah. So treatments have gotten better. And and in in the 80s, when I started practice, Women underwent radical mastectomies. I mean, which means they didn't just take the breast and then close up the the skin. They took the breast. They took the muscle. They took the fascia. I mean, it. They oh, they wow. were left with uh, scar just, tissue, just bones, yeah. their ribs, and skin that is was stuck over it. It was it was uh, it was very traumatic, and mm-hmm. it was it was women lost their feeling of being sexual yes, beings yes. because of that. And that's what everyone thinks of. But nowadays we actually do the type of mastectomy that you can have a, um, have an implant put in soon after the mastectomy and have, and actually not lose your shape. Or so the mechanics of the surgery have, have improved. Changed, yes. But and, all, the, and the need for taking everything, we don't have to take everything anymore because right. of mostly because of early detection. Right. We find them when they are not in a stage of of actually um, diving into the muscle and so they haven't contaminated or permeated everything. The other tissues. Yeah, so you just take it. what's bad out and leave the rest. Mm-hmm. You, you take most of the breast out. So <clears throat> surgery is an, an option that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. But chemotherapy mm-hmm. is also a prime or has been a primary treatment for cancer diagnosis. Mm-hmm. If you're diagnosed with cancer, first thing I want to talk to you about is you need chemo. Not every cancer was responsive to chemo. Mm-hmm. There's some lung cancers that only respond to radiation, sarcoma, radiation. But but for the cancers that respond to chemo, yeah. it used to be a foregone conclusion. If you had the cancer, generally you would be recommended to have the chemo after it. So, I mean, I have I have one patient who was told she had no nodes, was completely removed. She had double mastectomies. Wow. Um, and had implants put in. She was told that she had um, a very a very low risk of recurrence, but they were still recommended chemo. So she was very smart, and she was a medical person. So she asked the the um, oncologist. How much, how much will this improve my right, right. my uh, recovery or my ability to not to be cancer free? Yeah. And the oncologist said less than 001 percent. Wow. And she said. <laughs> but so why would you put yourself through that? Because it's really I don't your, even know your why your body's infused offered. with toxins and poisons. Well, t- the toxins themselves yeah. can cause leukemia or other uh, bone or bone marrow cancers down the line. You can have other cancers because of the chemo damaging other cells in your body. It can't so just you were, damage. So you were telling me there's, there's one medicine that they now give for breast cancer mm-hmm. that actually is known to cause uterine cancer. Right. And they've been giving and they, this And they don't always tell the patient that. They, so, they say, we're fighting this right now. This is what we're focused on. We can get that under control. If something else happens, it happens. Well, when they, it was really funny. We had an unusual relationship with these surgeons we would refer to. They would say, oh, my God, you're on estrogen. Well, that's now been proven that that doesn't cause breast cancer. Right. So 
they would then put them on tamoxifen. Well, tamoxifen, if you have a uterus, tamoxifen it has a very high rate of turning ut the uterine lining into cancer. <sighs> so as a gynecologist, I go, oh, you're on tamoxifen. I have to surveil you, so it's my problem. Right. So it's not their problem. Right. Because so they're only working on the upper. They're only working on the breast. Yeah. So now it's it's my problem, and and I I never said, well, you're on tamoxifen. You know that's going to cause. I just said, you know, we need to surveil you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it shouldn't be a blame situation, but but it was one way, and now we've gotten rid of that. A, that reason to blame us for estrogen because they've found other drugs besides tamoxifen. Well, I've I've recommended to people a very uh, effective drug is letrozole. It now has another name. I saw a commercial about it the other day, but it's that and Arimidex are both uh, aromatase inhibitors, and they actually decrease estrone, the old lady estrogen, not estradiol, but the old lady estrogen that is that does stimulate the breast cancer. So yeah. it is. It's one of those things that can be used orally. It does have side effects. If you don't have any estrogen in your body, it has side effects. If you do, usually doesn't have that much of a that much of a side effect. But uh, in general, it's much less dangerous. It's much less uh, much less difficult to live with. So we were talking about the fact that early stage diagnosis. Is, is critical to all the improvements that there are right. in the treatment of cancers. Right. And so an early stage breast tumor mm -hmm. where historically they would say automatically, oh, my God, we need to put you on chemo. Right. Even now they're not saying it as often. The statistics are that they've reduced early stage tumor treatments from chemo down from 35 percent down to 21 percent. Mm -hmm. And one of the main reasons for that is uh, – and I'm not saying this correctly. G genomic, yeah, genomic, both genomics of the patient and genomics of the cancer. Okay. So they know they now know what chemo will kill that type of cancer. Okay. Right, and they now know what patients will respond to that. So they've that refined cancer. the the packaging of the chemo. It's well, different drugs, different they intensities. Do it individually uh -huh. for a specific cancer. I mean, this is other cancers as well. Right. For a specific cancer, and then. They genetically, you can now find out if a drug's going to work for you. Like they have a genetic test for, I'm, I'm less familiar with the chemo uh, blood test, okay. but they have them for antidepressants to see if you need more or less, or even if it's going to work for you. And they have genetic tests to see if like statins are dangerous for you. So they also have these same genetic types of genetic tests for chemotherapy to see if it's going to work yes. in your body. So it's much more individualized and so we have early detection, we have um, better, better surgery, and we have targeted chemo, not blanket therapy for everybody who has right. a, a breast cancer. So with the targeted chemo then, are there fewer side effects or, or less severe side effects, or they are you still going to have them? In the, in the research that we've read, and I don't have, I don't have a lot of uh, experience mm -hmm. on the ground here. Okay. I have it. It's really through the research that I've read that 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 you shouldn't have as much as many side effects. You shouldn't have as much. Um, you should have more effective chemo, and it shouldn't be as as sick. The research refers to what they call a smart chemo bomb. Right. So they've tailored the chemo that they give you mm -hmm. to the particular tumor that you have that's been genetically defined. Right. And and one of the ways they genetically define it, one of the ways they make the decision is the size of the tumor. They're they're assigned a number. And if they are assigned a very low number because it's very early stage detection, mm -hmm. then they don't recommend chemo. But they're, they also but they also look at other things. They also look at um the activity or severity, the, how fast the cells divide. Uh -huh. Uh, they're a, how, how a, atypical they are, abnormal they are. And so that can change. It's not just on size, it's on size. I mean, they basically stage it by looking at the tumor itself because when, when you have a breast cancer, the breast cancer itself is not the same genetics as you or the rest of your breast tissue. It's a different genetics. And it, it works differently. It doesn't, like most cells, die after a certain number of divisions. It doesn't die. It just keeps going and right. gets bigger. So that's the that's the um, quality of being a cancer. It just keeps growing without uh, control. So basically, 
they look at all the factors that are in that piece of tissue they took out. Yeah. And then they decide from there whether you need chemotherapy or not. And they have some other genetic testing that they do to see if chemo, they give you a percentage of will it be effective or not. And the chemo is done after the surgery is done. Yes. So they make the decision to do surgery. You have the and tissue. Whatever kind of surgery they, they take out. Mm -hmm. Then they take the tissue and mm -hmm. test it. Right. Find out the data that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So and then you then you have chemo after you've healed from surgery because you don't heal very well when you're on chemo. Okay. So uh, the the biggest thing for for me about not giving chemo to absolutely everybody who kind of walks through the door who on the surface looks like they need it. Uh, I mean, many people do need it, but. I think that the, the down the line, I see a lot of patients who have been on chemo who have other cancers. Yeah. And so you don't know who those people will be, and we still don't. So you have to be careful. It's not just, oh, yeah. I mean, if it's going to save your life, you need chemo. But if it's so maybe we're going to have a recurrence, then we have to deal with it the same way we dealt with it this time. You know, if you leave breast tissue in, you can always get another breast cancer. Right. So it's possible oh, wow. that you might have a recurrence. Yes. So if that's the case, then you, then at, at a recurrence, you're going to have to have some kind of chemo. But it's also possible that you can just move to some other locale in your body. Well, if it's metastasized, if they do l lymph nodes when they take out the breast tissue, if there's cancer in the lymph nodes, that means it's out of the box. It's out. There's cells everywhere, so you need chemo. Yeah. But if they do the lymph nodes and they're negative. Well, that's what they call metastasized. Mm -hmm. If it's an older, larger tumor yeah. and it's they're, metastasized. Or it's very active, then, then it'll you metastasize absolutely early. still need And chemo. there's certain types of cancers, breast cancers, like inflammatory cancer. They're very fast. They go from nothing uh, to big and hot and red. So if you ever have a big, hot, red area on your breast, you go directly to your doctor immediately. If you can't get in, you just tell them you think you have a, a uh, hot breast cancer. So <laughs> They'll I, get you in. I had a friend in his late 50s, early 60s, mm -hmm. who was diagnosed with lung cancer mm -hmm. and was treated. I don't know about surgery, but I know he had heavy chemo. Mm -hmm. And they basically said after several months of treatment, the cancer was cured. And then about a month later, he died from a heart attack. Right. And that's another risk with some many chemotherapeutic drugs is that they damage the heart muscle. So your heart muscle, either they damage the, the lining of the blood vessels or the heart muscle itself. It depends on the chemo. And that can then cause you to have heart disease or death. So, so the decision matrix, if we don't treat this with chemo, it'll kill you. If you, I mean, if you But if you we have, do, the chemo may kill you. That's true. But I mean... You have to you have to look at this as if you have an advanced cancer. Yes. If if you well, it's like a triage. You, you, you have to you have to take that to live long enough to have a heart attack. Yeah. So yeah, yes, no, no, it's I, necessary. I get it. it just seems but tragic. It just it, it is, but that's all we've got right now. Yeah. But we're trying to get better at it, and that's the controversy going on where well, that's between the doctors that go, oh, everybody or most people need chemo, yeah. and not everybody needs chemo, and maybe we should. Stop because it's risky for other diseases. So the point of today's discussion is that among physicians, there are ongoing debates about what's the best path forward. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have a one-size-fits-all. Everybody has to do it. Mm -hmm. We are learning more. Mm -hmm. We are being able to tailor smart chemo bombs mm -hmm. to specific tumors that we know about. Mm -hmm. And we're also able to monitor people that we catch early enough and not do chemo but mm -hmm. do other treatments mm -hmm. and have progress and have success. Right. So it's not just something to automatically panic over. Right. You shouldn't make an emotional decision, although I understand why you might. Oh, yeah. Because that kind of fear, we've all had that kind of fear over other things. Yes. And that kind of fear makes us make rash decisions. So we have to try to get the other side of our brain working and think about the facts and the and the information that we've been given and then maybe get another opinion. Always get a second or third opinion, especially on a life of life threatening diagnosis. Unless you have to have an emergency surgery that's advised. But right. the New England Journal of Medicine has much of this information uh, in its in one of its um, 
not 2000 or excuse me 2015 journals uh, about the difference in the new chemo so it might be even more advanced by now in 2018 right but this was this was just re um, it was brought up in a new article with the new chemo uh, therapy coming out so trying to get the word out there we, that we just did, wanted you to be aware of the process of how ke how breast cancer and some other cancers are are um, diagnosed and treated, and then the different choices in treatment and how you can get a more specific kind of therapy for your cancer and how that's done so that you understand it, so that you can make a more educated decision if this faces you or someone in your household. Being an informed consumer, being an active participant in your own healthcare decisions is your responsibility, and it's a thing that we absolutely encourage you to do. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.